Psychologists say that to change your life, you have to get rid of your old habits. But to do this, you have to start a long and fierce struggle with yourself. I think it happened last December. I wanted to try and do something new. I had this idea of choosing something every month and focusing on it. And because we started occasionally doing exercises with my roommate earlier in December, I decided that the easiest thing to start me off would be some sort of physical activity that I could do every single day. 12 new habits in 12 months. A year ago, Olga Isayeva decided to carry out an experiment to form a new habit every 30 days. Olga chose the actions that she always struggled with or had never done at all. The goal of the first month of the experiment, regular exercise, today became a necessity for her. It's already become my habit. A habit means something you do automatically. The simplest analogy is brushing your teeth or drinking water in the morning for those who develop the habit. So the first thing you do automatically when you wake up is you get up and you drink some water. The same thing happened to physical exercise. Two or three times a week I just get up and do it because I crave it. It's become some sort of a reflex. Physical exercise became a habitual action for Olga, but starting the day with sports is not for everyone. How is a habit formed? Can we call this behavior a reflex? Talking about habits, I'm personally very used to eating oatmeal for breakfast now. I wake up, I drink a glass of water, and then I put some hot water into my oatmeal. I don't even cook it. Then I do my exercises and prepare food for the day. I usually take some vegetables with me to have a snack on a break between studies. And I choose a carrot over chocolate. I put everything into my lunchbox and take it with me to university. As the next goal of our experiment, Olga chose changing of her eating habits. She decided to pay more attention to what she eats. In several months, she managed to switch to protein-rich products, fresh vegetables, and slow carbs over fast ones. I've been living like this for two months now, and it has really become a habit. I mean, I almost never eat outside of my house. I always have things in my lunchbox. To develop a new habit, Olga set up a term of one month. She went on a popular belief that any action turns into a routine in 21 days. This legend was born in plastic surgery in the middle of the 20th century. Back then it was shown that on average when an arm or some other organ is amputated or something else changes within the human body, the corresponding neural network needs 21 days to adopt to these changes. Actually, it doesn't completely readjust, so this subject is somewhat questionable. But these 21 days are a period needed for a person to finally comprehend that he cannot move or touch or feel something. In reality, the rate of forming a new habit depends on how useful our body will consider it to be. The behavior to be adopted fastest of all is the one that is followed by a reward. What's interesting is that the simplest reward is eating something. Because food is unconditional. If we talk about other types of reinforcement, a habit can be effectively developed by emphasizing our curiosity. For example, if I read this boring work-related article or that boring book, I will allow myself to go to an exhibition next weekend or to read something exciting. So we can act on the level of basic eating behaviors, but we can also choose our curiosity level. It may sound surprising, but curiosity has a bigger impact on most people. The timing of the reward also plays an important role in building a habit. Faster results of a new action increase the probability of it becoming regular. This is one of the reasons it's so hard to turn sports into your habit. To see a result, you have to wait. 
but sometimes giving up an old habit is much harder than acquiring a new one. Why is it so difficult to let go of a bad habit? From the physiological point of view, a habit is a set of neural networks stored in the cerebral cortex. Certain circumstances, for example, making a tea or closing the door, activate these neural connections. When actions repeat regularly, neurons fire along the same path. Consequently, the neural network becomes well-defined and easily activated when necessary. These neural pathways can be compared to a well-trotted trail with electrical signals moving along it instead of people. The strength of these neuron connections defines the strength of our habit. And behavioral patterns can be easily reinstated even when they seem totally forgotten. For years, we feel very comfortable performing a certain action. And then we're told, nope, you can't do this anymore. Our consciousness, our frontal lobe, says stop. And it's very difficult to get off this huge road, this wonderful, well-shaped neural connection to a new, small and unshaped one. It's much easier to walk on a beaten path. That's why we slip up so often when we're building something new. It's a lot easier to get back on this huge highway of neural connections. And the stronger, so to say, this highway is, the less likely this new path will be used. And the more often we'll turn off of it, and the more often we'll slip up. The pathways that lead to an unhealthy lifestyle are the ones we usually try to disrupt. It's overeating, favoring fatty and sweet food, sedentary lifestyle. These behaviors are commonly called bad habits, but they are bad only in our consciousness. They're optimal for our body. It feels comfortable this way. Our body tells us, I'm great. I'm great eating unhealthy food because it's more saturated. If tomorrow there is no food, I'll have my resources and I'll be fine. I'll be able to make up for it. That's why I like it and I feel better with it. But we know that most likely the crisis won't come, that evolutionally everything has changed. We live in the times that are favorable for our body and we need to restrict ourselves. We have to contradict our nature and our nature is to accumulate. Our nature disagrees with us a bit. Social acceptance can become a major incentive for breaking some behavioral rituals. For example, some people feel comfortable littering in their apartment and avoid cleaning for weeks on end. Our body supports this behavior. Indeed, why should we waste our energy on cleaning? But society convinces us that it's shameful to be a slob and we should keep things in order. In the case of Olga, who decided to spend a year forming new habits, the most challenging part was to give up social networks. This is a very broad topic because at the moment I do spend a lot of time on the internet using my smartphone or my computer. When a lot of communication in your life happens via social networks, you believe that you have to stay constantly online, not to miss anything, to stay in the know, to answer all messages in time. So, as an experiment, I tried to eliminate all social networks while still keeping my smartphone. But I was working on a project at the time, and I really needed to communicate with everyone. And so, in just five days, I gave up and installed all of my apps back. So, basically, my experiment in that month failed. The habit that Olga had no difficulties in developing is meditation. According to her, daily spiritual practice helps her to distance herself from the surroundings and control her emotions. And she can do it just about anywhere. Olga meditates in her university during the break between classes. You simply sit down, close your eyes, and try to focus on your breath. Well, not even try, you just observe your breath. And then, at the same time, you observe the thoughts that pass through your head. There's a good analogy for this. It's like you approach a highway with cars going both ways on it, 
And you sit down on the sidewalk and you watch the cars passing by. You can get into one of those cars and surrender to that thought that you had and go somewhere. But later you have to get out of the car and go back to the sidewalk and keep watching the traffic. So what you have to do is observe what's happening in your head. Habits shouldn't be confused with addictions. Addiction is a pathological, painful state. Anything can become an object of addiction, from computer games and internet to consuming chemical agents and food. A certain action might come to the forefront at the cost of everything else. A habit, on the other hand, is a natural mechanism that helps us to save resources. Routine actions don't interfere with our physiology and emotions. A habit shouldn't be confused with a skill either. Both actions become automatic after multiple repetitions. The main difference between the two is awareness. Let's draw the line here. A skill is a certain function that we worked and worked and worked on and then it developed. A habit is something we put a little effort in, but it formed nonetheless. A skill means I learn. For three weeks, I've been cutting carrots in star-shaped pieces, and by the end of the third week, I managed to make all the stars the same size. That's a skill. I acquired a skill. I learned. A habit is when I don't think, I just cut. The difference between a skill and a habit can be explained if we look at handwriting. The handwriting skill has a complicated psychophysiological structure. It includes mechanisms of articulation, visual memory, motor coordination, and certain linguistic proficiency. The technical part of learning how to write is additionally complicated with the fact that children of four to five years old have poorly developed hand muscles, flawed system of neural control, and uncalibrated mechanisms of movement coordination. Multiple exercises and repetitions gradually fine-tune all the systems necessary for handwriting. A developed skill means it's no longer necessary to control every element of the movement. The speed and smoothness of the moves increase. So handwriting is a skill. A habit is how often we write and things we do during writing. Alexander Pushkin, for example, used to leave his famous scribbles and drawings on the margins of paper. Nikolai Gogol and Ernest Hemingway preferred to write standing. The patriarch of French prose romance, Victor Hugo, had an extravagant habit. He worked on his novels naked after having locked all of his clothes. This way, he was depriving himself of any possibility to stop working and go out. But the award for the weirdest writer's habit goes to Frederick Schiller. This poet couldn't work unless one drawer of his desk was filled with rotten apples. Who knows, maybe their smell made him dizzy and opened new horizons for his imagination to fly. You'd think that changing the habits is in the power of their owners. But in reality, behavioral rituals are being formed every day without our active participation, under influence of advertising and marketing. There's a very good example in the history of advertising. It's quite famous among marketing specialists. Up to a certain point, dyeing hair was considered a very vulgar thing, worthy only of scarlet women who were trying to attract attention this way. But when one of the advertising campaigns showed that hair dye can be used by women from the upper class as well, it completely changed this mindset. And the hair dye became acceptable for women from the upper class as well. This is the way habits are formed. It's thanks to advertising that people got into the habit of brushing their teeth. It happened at the beginning of the last century as a result of a large-scale toothpaste campaign. People became convinced that a Snow White smile is beautiful and everyone can afford it. You just have to brush your teeth regularly. It has been determined that the most effective way to form a habit with a commercial is to make an impact on the emotional level. And the key emotion capable of driving people to act 
is fear. When they show us microbes on TV, of course they do it with different level of success. But they try to create the most negative image of a microbe, the one that you want to flush away, to get rid of. You really don't want for it to be a present in your bathroom, in your throat when you are sick and so on. That's why it was proven that the closest distance between exposure and action is through emotional impact, negative emotional impact, to be precise, the one that causes fear. So what we are going to do right now is to register the eye movement of a person watching different commercials. This will allow us to see how advertising affects the formation of our habits. The effectiveness of commercials is easy to check with eye tracking, a technology that registers a direction of gaze. We asked the subject of our experiment to watch a selection of commercials. In the meantime, we are observing his eye movements. Using this method of eye movement registering, we can evaluate the effectiveness of different commercials. We can understand if the elements that are meant to attract attention were chosen correctly. Because we can see if a person is looking at them or not. And if he does, how often it happens. And how many times his eyes return to these areas of interest that were designed to draw his attention. Successful advertisement creates a state of emotional excitement. And it's the first signal to forming a new habit. A person suddenly wants to buy the advertised product or act like the characters in the video. In our case, the strongest emotions were caused by a car commercial. It was predictable as our subject is in the target audience of that video. These lines show where the subject was looking while watching the videos. We call these lines heat maps because they light up those areas of the picture that attracted the most attention. And we see that during some of the videos, the subject made a lot of eye movements. Especially, he liked the car commercial. He looked at the car from every angle, paid attention to certain design features. He focused more on the car itself than on the plot line of the commercial. The women's shampoo commercial had a contrary effect. The subject didn't pay any attention to the product. He was much more interested in the girl presenting it. A year has passed since Olga started her experiment. In these 12 months, she tried to develop 12 new habits. Not all of them became everyday routines, but Olga wasn't aiming for that anyway. But at the end of every month, I usually sit down and sum up the results of the month anyway. Am I happy with what I was doing? Did I miss anything? Do I want to go on? Because if you acquire a new habit every month, they will build up like that. And in the end, your whole day will consist solely of habits. But that's impossible. Nevertheless, Olga achieved the main goal of the experiment. She realized that there are a lot of things that you will never know until you get rid of your old habits. They say that if you keep doing the same thing, you will achieve the same result. Basically, by saying or doing something new, by integrating new healthy habits in your life, you leave this circle of familiarity. You get to a new level. And it brings you new friends and new goals. I'd like to explain to all these other people how these small steps and small experiments can really help them change, set new goals, achieve them, and get something new. And in the end, of course, ultimately become more happy. Habits are invented by nature to help our body in saving energy. But apart from its physiological function, this behavior shapes our life that one way or another consists of a sequence of routines. We won't get a seed at the end of the routine labyrinth for overcoming ourselves and developing a new habit, but we might find the exit.